Okay, well, we're, we're at the last panel of the day on climate and health communication. And we've had a great, great discussions all day. It's um, been wonderful to hear the, the quite diverse range of views and the ways that this issue has, has been approached. Um, and I think a lot of grounds for surprising optimism. And from someone like me coming from Washington and you know, saturated with the all Trump all the time, this has been a really invigorating change to, to, to talk about you know, all that's possible, all that's happening at the city level, all the, the, the possibilities of, of taking positive action uh, on climate and relating it to the, to the lives of people. I had one experience I wanted to share just before we bring up um, Ed Maybach to, to begin. Uh, we did a conference, the Pulitzer Center on Environment and Religion in Beijing in 2015. And it was about Beijing, China being China. It took us about four years to negotiate doing a conference that we co-sponsored with the Yale Forestry School on that issue and getting permission, finding a sponsor. And when we first part started, I first started going to China in, on this topic in 2011, 2012, this was when the U.S. Embassy was putting out the PM 2.5, the particulate pollution uh, measurements, and that was the only source of that information for people in China. And the Chinese government was very unhappy with it, actively um, trying to tamp down coverage of it, denying it. And, and, and you got, as, the, you know, as you had more and more bad pollution days uh, in Beijing and across the country, that and other environmental pollution issues that affected the, the health and daily lives of, of Chinese citizens, it, it, it led to massive protests all over the country, tens of thousands of protests in communities everywhere. And, and the government, even in the authoritarian environment of China, uh, had to respond to, to, to the public uh, you know, felt, expressed uh, outrage about what was going on. And so by the time we got to 2015, did the conference, the, the government was not only uh, publicizing the PM 2.5 numbers itself and positioning itself as a champion of addressing climate change, environmental issues, but they also were actively reaching out to religious leaders and the government itself invoking uh, Confucianist, Taoist, Buddhist, to talk about how they were going to, to respond to the environmental challenges of, of China. So it was a really important lesson uh, to me, sort of demonstration of what's possible when we do make these kinds of connections. And so thinking about how to do it effectively uh, how to use all the tools at our command now, and from social media to, uh, to documentaries to, to, uh, to feature films. Uh, we're lucky we have people today on this last, last panel who have a lot of expertise on this. So we're going to begin with the principal uh, remarks from Ed Maybach, uh, from George Mason, uh, who's been a leader in studying climate change uh, communication. And, well, Ed will have 15 minutes or so. I think we're going to you know, have the clock running. We'll try to keep within that. And then, and then I'll come back up and just um, briefly introduce the, the three other speakers, and then we'll have a conversation after. So, Ed. Hello. Hi. So I'm going to do something this afternoon that I have never done before. I'm going to start and finish my presentation with references to Joanne Silberner, my, my dear friend. Uh, Joanne said this morning that stories are about people. That's really important. It's worth merits saying over and over again. Stories are about people. Stories, numbers aren't stories. Um, data don't tell stories. Um, evidence can be used to tell a compelling story, but even evidence isn't really a story. Stories are about people. I would love to take some time this afternoon to tell you a couple of compelling stories, stories that I find compelling, um, but that's not actually, unfortunately, what I came to do this morning, uh, this afternoon. I, I came to answer three questions, but before I get to those three questions, the answers to those three questions, um, just a Two quick stories. So eight years ago, we did a, my colleagues and I did a, uh, a survey of TV weathercasters. Um, 
and we learned that half of America's TV weathercasters were interested in educating their viewers about how climate change was changing conditions in their backyards already. Um, unfortunately, my, uh, the, the results, the only time my research has ever appeared on page one of the New York Times was the results of that survey. Leslie Kaufman decided that the half who were interested in educating their viewers was less interested than what the other half of TV meteorologists had to say about human climate change, which was at the time they questioned whether or not it was even happening. Um, we, subsequent to that survey, we found one TV weathercaster, Jim Gandy, a very brave man who works in Columbia, South Carolina, who wanted, when I put the word out that I was looking for guinea pigs, who would work with me to test out whether or not it was a good idea to educate people about climate, how climate change is changing conditions in their backyard on the evening weather cast. Um, a very brave guy, Jim Gandy, raised his hand and said, I'll work with you. Um, we evaluated his effort over the course of a year it turned out to be a very good idea. It actually was very well received by his viewers in conservative Columbia, South Carolina. Um, we evaluated, from our evaluation, we learned that his viewers came to understand climate change as a more personally relevant issue than viewers of other local stations in Columbia, South Carolina. And now, eight years later, we've taken that fundamental insight and we have built reporting resources for TV weathercasters, any interested TV weathercaster in America who would like to educate their viewers about the local impacts of climate change in the way that Jim Gandy did. 506 of the approximately 2,000 TV weathercasters in America are now using these reporting materials. So that is a really, for me, <laughs> as a communication scientist who is desperately trying to figure out how to engage more Americans in the understanding the issue of climate change and understanding that we have important decisions to make, that's a really important story. I think I'll take a pass on the second story and get, get to my three questions that I was asked to answer for you all today. Um, sort of fundamental to why we're here, um, are these three questions. Does the public know anything about how climate change is harming our health? Um, and if they do know, does it matter? And finally, are journalists interested in telling those stories? Journalists are an incredible set of, um, I will call them public safety professionals, public education professionals. They are the sort of our front line of offense in letting us know when we have issues that need to be thought through. And so these are sort of three related questions that I think are central to why we are here today. And now I'm not gonna tell you a story, I'm gonna show you data. Um, the first thing you have to understand about the first question that I posed is the first question being, does the public understand our health is being harmed by climate change? The first thing you need to know is that most Americans do understand that our climate is changing, but, and this is a big but, they see it as a distant problem, not today's problem. They see it as harming likely to harm us in the future, not yet, it's a future problem, likely to harm other places, not here, and likely to harm other species, not us. The reality, and we know this reality from the National Climate Assessment and lots of other sources, is that climate change is happening here now in every community in America, and really every region of the world, in, ways, in a variety of ways that are harmful to us. So it's really important to understand, it's not that the public is skeptical of the reality of climate change, it's just that they have a fundamental misperception and they perceive it as distant. Um, we have asked people, well, what kind of a problem is global warming? We know they see it as distant, but we don't really know what kind of a problem they see it as. And so we, we give them a, a list of possible problems that global warming may or may not be seen as. Um, and you, from this data, you can see that most people see it as an environmental issue or a scientific issue or an agricultural or food issue or a severe weather issue or number five on this list, about, two out of, about six out of 10 Americans do see it to some degree as, at least they tell us, they see it as a health issue. But I want you to keep in mind, we prompted them with asking them, do you see this as a health issue? And so six out of 10 Americans say, yes, we, 
I, I do see this as a health issue. We, we've gone at this question through a number of other uh, lenses. Um, we ask people to just sort of rate on a scale from negative three to positive three how bad or good global warming is for the health of Americans. Um, not terribly surprising, people don't say it's good. Um, about six out of 10 say it's bad. Um, but again, I'm asking people, this is large numbers of people, this particular survey was 1,275 people, but we've asked this a number of times. I'm seeding people with a very specific question, how bad is global warming for the health of Americans? You might think I might be leading the witness, and the first clue that I got that I might be leading the witness with the way I ask those questions is I ask people, well, how much prior to me asking you those questions, how much had you ever thought about the health relevance of global warming? And most people said, not very much, or not at all. So, which was a clue that, okay, maybe, maybe that six out of 10 number, maybe it's an illusion as opposed to a meaningful reality. Um, so then I thought to ask people a an open-ended question. Rather than feed them the answer, I just ask them the question. The question in this case is, in your view, what health problems related to global warming are Americans experiencing, if any? Um, most people, the most common response was, uh, don't know, uh, no response at all, or don't know. Um, lung diseases was the first, the, 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 the correct answers, by the way, which this is all based on content analysis of coding open-ended data. Um, lung diseases, 14% of the public said, okay, that is the way in which global warming is, is harming the health of Americans through lung diseases. 11% um, said there are no health impacts, 6% talked about extreme weather or nat national disasters or changes to our season. Um, but the point, I won't go through the whole list, the point here is that when you ask a harder question, what do you really know? The answer, for most people, the answer is nothing. I don't really know anything. Um, which starts to give us a different sense of what it is when, what we should interpret it to mean when six out of 10 people tell us that global warming is a health issue. We, as, public, as a public health professional, I ask a related question. Are all Americans at equal risk of being harmed by, uh, having their health harmed by global warming, or are some of us at greater risk than others? Same pattern of responses, um, even actually less likely to find Americans who understand that some of us are more vulnerable to climate and, climate and health risks than others. For most people, it's just not something they've heard about. It's not something they've thought about. It isn't anything they have any knowledge about. So the answer to the question, does the public know that climate change is harming our health? I would contend, and I've got a lot more data I could show, but let's just cut to the chase. I would contend that the answer is that very few people have any real knowledge, but large numbers of Americans are inclined to believe that climate change is bad for our health. And the reason they're inclined to believe that is because it's sort of a fundamental insight from cognitive science is that when we are asked a question and we don't have an answer to the question, we substitute for a question we do have an answer to. So the answer to the question, people will hear my, my questions as, how bad a thing is global warming? Um, that's not what I'm asking them, but that's what they will hear. And they will say, yeah, it's a bad, it's a bad thing. It must be bad for our health, because it's, it's a bad thing. So I, again, I would contend that very few people have any actual knowledge about how global warming, the relevance of climate change to our health, but most Americans are inclined to believe. So let's move on to the second question is, well, does it actually help if we provide them with information? We've talked a lot about that today. Um, and there has been a lot of assuming going on that it should be helpful. Um, I actually have some data to that, speak to that point. I, I try to uh, use assumptions as little as possible in my work. Um, so the first study we conducted to test this question, the National, the, the, um, National Climate Health Assessment released in 2016 is I think about a thousand pages long. It's um, lots of information there, way too much to actually try to share with the public. So what we did is we boiled it down. In that thousand pages, there's basically 
six relatively simple, clear statements about, uh, not six, I'm sorry, eight relatively simple statements about the ways in which climate change is harming our health. We distilled those statements out in, in a common format. We answered three questions for each of the, the eight climate and health risks, extreme heat and extreme weather being two of them. Um, we answered the question, what is happening? Um, how is, what is happening in our climate? How is that harming our health? And who is most likely to have their health harmed? For each of these eight answers, we kept it to almost exactly 150 words each. When we shared this information with people, it wasn't all pretty in multiple colors. It was just black, black writing on white, white paper, but eventually we made it pretty. Um, so those two risks, as well as uh, the impacts of air pollution and, and vector-borne diseases and contaminated water, contaminated food, threats to nutrition, and threats to our mental health. Um, so what we did is we asked people to read each of these 850-word, I'll call them essays. And then at both before and after each of the essays, we asked them questions. Um, what we randomly assign them to either read these essays or, or to read nothing in particular. Um, and we, um, so we had a relatively large number of people. We ran through this experiment. Um, 1,853 of them read the essays. At the end of the entire essay reading exercise, we asked them the questions again. And then two to three weeks later, we came back and we asked them the questions for a third time. Uh, what we learned is um, on the bottom of this slide that we learned that reading these short essays, so eight times 150 word explanations about how climate change is harming our health, led people to, to, to rate the health impacts of global warming as worse than they previously had, um, led them to rate global warming as being more personally relevant to them. Um, led them to become more worried about global warming and led them, uh, made them become more likely to believe that their health would be harmed. I feel like these are all totally appropriate conclusions to reach from the, from the, the learnings of the, the, net, the climate and health assessment. So I would consider this a success in sharing important information that people like you, experts in climate and health, know. When we went back two weeks, two to three weeks later, some, two of the four uh, of those impacts were still in evidence. People still rated the health impacts of global warming as worse, and they were still more worried about those health impacts than they were previously. The other two were still in the right direction, but over time these things fade, which is, um, as Stacy said this morning, which is why it's so important that we have simple, clear messages that get repeated and repeated and repeated through a variety of trusted voices because it takes people a while, many repetitions, to start to incorporate new information into what they know and believe about the world. So this was just, uh, you could see the short term and the, the medium term impact of presenting people, helping people understand that climate change is indeed harming our health. Um, but, clim but fossil fuel use, harms our health both through the changing climate and independently of the changing climate. And there are a lot more Americans who are willing to have an open mind about the wisdom or the lack thereof of continuing to fuel our economy through with fossil fuel than there are Americans who are willing to consider the implications of climate change. So w my team is very interested in, is that a different conversation that we can start with the public, talking about the health effects of fossil fuel use and just not even talking about global warming? Um, is it a better conversation or is it a different conversation? Both of those are would be important answers to have. Um, I don't actually want you to read all of these statements, but I, I do want to tell you that what we did is we took, um, I, I don't have it with me, but we distilled the science about um, both sort of the long and well understood health impacts of, of uh, fossil fuel combustion on human health, sort of the cardiovascular uh, and, and the, the lung related impacts, as well as we distilled the evidence, the new evidence about the, the neuro, what I call the neurotoxic impacts of fossil fuel use for babies, children in utero, um, older adults, people, people in low income communities who are exposed to more air pollution. Um, and we 
developed a set of 10 messages in as simple, clear language as we were capable of, of expressing. And we, had, we showed them these 10 messages in groups of four, sort of like our laid out here. And we just asked people, of these messages, which is most and least personally, uh, uh, in personally important to you? And so it was a simple ranking exercise. But because we, we did this uh, eight different screens of, of four messages, it allowed us to disentangle which, uh, which of this information, which of these messages, provided the most useful information according to people's own values and, and what they currently know. And by the way, these four messages were the top four in terms of engaging the most people. I'll point you only to the third one down the page because that was the highest rated message, the one that most people said was most important to them. Air pollution and toxic chemicals released when fossil fuels are burned can cause delays in development, reduced IQ, attention deficits, learning difficulties, behavioral problems, and autism in babies and children, even when the exposure occurs before birth. This was the top rated message for young parents, young adults, their parents, grandparents, um, people in high income households, people in low income households. Pretty much this is the one piece of information about the way in which fossil fuel combustion harms human health that resonated most with most Americans because, well, I think it's obvious because, because we care about children. Um, so after we went, we took people through that message ranking exercise, I, um, they were changed in a whole variety of positive ways. They saw more risk associated with uh, air pollution, water pollution, and climate change. They perceived more risk associated with, harm, with fossil fuels. They wanted to see America move, um, accelerate the transition to a clean renewable energy future. They wanted government and industry to do more. They, want, they were, became more opposed to a fossil fuel plant being built near their home, um, and they had greater intention to take political action to do something about it. So exactly the kind of impact one would want to see when we share information that we believe is important about the relevance of the harms of fossil fuel to our health. So the answer to the second question, in my opinion, uh, based on this evidence and more, is a de decisive yes. It helps when we share what we know. Um, the very final point has to do with journalists. Um, I do, I, in, in addition to spending the past eight years working with TV weathercasters, and as a result of that work, my colleagues at Climate Central and I, we produce localized climate analyses that for every media market in America that tell the story of how climate change is changing condition in people's backyards, including health impacts. We decided last year that this information was too important to only give to TV weathercasters. We want to activate other local journalists to tell local climate impact and local climate solution stories. So this January, I conducted surveys with members of four different professional journalism societies. Um, National Association, uh, RTDNA, that's the Radio and Television Digital News Association. Those are the editors, news directors that Joanne said are so important. Um, the National Association of Black Journalists, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and the Society for, uh, of Environmental Journalists. I'm happy to tell you that America's journalists get human-caused climate change. More than nine out of 10 of them are already convinced based on the evidence that they've seen. Um, they are really interested in telling local climate stories, but they're not telling them yet, um, which is why I'm gonna end my story with what Joanne mentioned this morning. They tell us that they lack time for field reporting, they lack role models, they lack a number of other fairly basic things, but they are interested. I'll move you all the way over to the right-hand side of that slide. Human health impact stories are the stories they are second to most interested in telling. So the story they're most interested in telling, drought and water shortages, but come, coming back again to Joanne, drought and water, is, no, water shortages are not people. You can make them about people, but human health is inevitably a story about people. So if we are to do our job, in helping journalists do their job to help Americans understand that climate change is not only changing our weather, but it's harming our health now in a variety of ways. And not all of us equally, but our children, 
more than others, um, people in low-income communities more than others, and, and our parents more than others. Those are stories that America's journalists are willing to tell, but are struggling right now. They need our help in getting, sharing with them what we know in a manner that breaks through their busy 24 hour, their struggle to put up with and, and thrive in a 24 hour news cycle. So all of the um, um, wonderful wisdom that Joanne shared with us earlier about how to do that, I encourage all of us to take that to heart. How can we take what we know, make it simple and clear, find compelling ways to personally share it with the public through blogging, through our social media, through our, our research center or our lab's websites, um, and, and by hosting interesting meetings that attract journalists to us so they can learn what, they, what we know and help us help them. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ed. And now we've got uh, three uh, people presenting uh, who each have, you know, in different ways, have really worked hard at bringing these types of stories and telling them in ways that, that reach uh, the public that needs to hear them. Uh, so first, I think we'll hear from Jack Cushman, uh, as managing editor Inside Climate News and uh, uh, several decades of work at the New York Times and other so-called legacy uh, news outlets before, is now bringing uh, that expertise to what has become the, you know, one of the, the country's greatest uh, sources of information on climate-related uh, issues. And after that, Howie Frumpkin from University of Washington School of Public Health, and who is Howie's a prolific uh, contributor uh, to not only scientific publications, but more importantly for this conversation, to uh, general interest uh, circulation uh, news outlets as well to try to address these issues. And then lastly, from Sabrina McCormick, a sociologist at the Milken Institute of Public Health at, at George Washington, uh, who has been involved in a wide array of really innovative uh, ways of, of telling these stories, including through uh, feature filmmaking, which you'll hear about this afternoon. So first, I would just go in order and first, uh, first Jack. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, uh, Inside Climate News, many of you have, I'm sure, never heard of it. We're a very small, nonprofit, web based, independent journalism organization, if you'll forgive the oxymoron. Um, the uh, core of our work is investigative and accountability journalism. But we also attempt to keep up with the bouncing ball of the news. And we have been growing. Um, we're supported by philanthropies, a few corporations, um, no corporations that are in the fossil fuel business, no corporations that are um, special interests in the areas that we cover. We may be best known, <coughs> excuse me, for the we may be best known for the work we did on Exxon uh, Corporation and its early understanding of uh, climate change based on documents that we found from its research operations in the 1970s and 1980s, a time when they were at the cutting edge of the understanding of climate change and came to realize the fundamental um, uh, threat that uh, addressing climate change would pose to the fossil fuel industries because even then it was clear that the limiting factor on people's use of fossil fuels would be not running out of them, but the need to bring emissions eventually to zero. And zero is a core message that needs to be communicated better than it is. Uh, if I were to ask you about the opioid crisis and say, as public health professionals, what's the ideal level of uh, opiate addiction? What's the ideal number of uh, pregnant women or mothers addicted to opioids that you would like to see in your clinics? You wouldn't have difficulty 
having zero as the target. What's the right number of people that we should see on the streets in this neighborhood who are addicted to opioids? Uh, with fossil fuel emissions of carbon dioxide, zero is the science-based answer. And I'm surprised sometimes that people don't realize that whatever amount of warming we are willing to tolerate, whether it's the one degree that we've experienced so far, Celsius, the two degrees of the Paris Treaty, or the more ambitious one and a half degrees Celsius of warming, or maybe a, let's say, fair six degrees, which would make the world large, uh, parts of the world uninhabitable, um, or four degrees, three degrees, name your target. Tell me how much warming you are willing to tolerate in the atmosphere, and I will tell you the date by which our emissions of carbon dioxide from our energy systems has to reach zero. And because the carbon dioxide builds up, and once you've layered the blanket on, the Earth continues to warm. And so zero is a non-negotiable number, except that <coughs> uh, in terms of time. Well, we don't necessarily know when we have to reach zero, but we do know that we do have to reach zero. And we do know that it will be more expensive the longer we wait. So as public health professionals, one of the simplest messages that you can communicate is that in the interests of public health, it's imperative that we rapidly, as rapidly as possible, get these emissions to zero. Uh, I'm all for storytelling. I'm all for people in our stories. But there's an element of journalism, which is eat your broccoli journalism. And you need to, even if you don't make it the heart of your message, you need to understand the science and the compelling science that lies behind your message. And I, I'm sure you're aware that the Paris Treaty sets an ambition of restricting warming to two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels with an ambition to restrict it to one and a half degrees. Well, what's the difference between one and a half degrees of warming and two degrees of warming? What, what possible difference does it make? The reason the one and a half degree number found its way into the Paris Agreement is that there are people who live in that half degree of difference, the clearest example being the Marshall Islands, which might have a chance of surviving at one and a half degrees, but probably will not have a chance of surviving at two degrees. In coral reef ecosystems, two degrees might get you uh, a possibility of saving 10% of the tropical coral ecosystems. One and a half degrees will get you a two-thirds probability of saving half of the tropical coral reef ecosystems. And there are people who rely on those ecosystems. So um, I am uh, engaged in a search for some of these people of the half degree. And I'm looking for the stories that represent, and I think that I would say, children of the half degree, those people for whom our decisions today are uh, extremely important, vitally important. The scientific work to delineate this difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees is being done by the IPCC right now in a full-blown research effort involving hundreds, maybe more than a thousand scientists. Their draft report is circulating for comment. Um, it's not a public document, although it has, it has leaked to uh, some journalists. Um, the IPCC, in refining this document for publication in November, is soliciting comments to bring the science as up-to-date as possible as long as the science is published in peer-reviewed literature by mid-May. So the window is open for people who are interested in seeing this very important work by the IPCC reflect the needs of the public health community 
to make your comments known. You just have to find one of your colleagues who is a participant in this process or go to the IPCC and express your interest and you will be able to uh, influence the process. But that's not a matter of narrative storytelling, that's a matter of, of knowing this very arcane process and understanding when you have an opportunity for an intervention. The difference between reaching two degrees and one and a half degrees is probably the difference between getting to zero emissions by 2050 and, pardon my voice, <coughs> and getting uh, uh, to zero emissions by 2070. To get to zero by 2050 requires extremely ambitious action, but it is something that is doable. And all the messages that you've heard today are aimed at the rapid achievement of this zero target. I look forward to finding the place where I can tell the story of these children who live in the half degree. I'm thinking of a country where the average per capita carbon footprint is one ton a year compared to the United States, 12, 14 tons a year compared to Europe, six, China, seven. So this country is not to blame for the problem. It's 100 million people live on 7,500 islands. Do we know the country? No, not Indonesia. Uh, they, they are frequently hit by Category 5 typhoons, the Philippines. That country is devastated. It, it faces public health devastation under the current warming of one degree. What will one and a half degrees mean to them? And what will the difference between one and a half and two degrees mean to them? It's interesting that the Philippines has in its constitution a human rights commission. And the human rights commission is empowered to protect the rights of the Filipino people. They're suing the big oil companies for the damages that are going to be inflicted. And the discovery that comes from lawsuits like that, or the lawsuits being brought by cities based partly on inside climate news uh, work, the discovery of the history of how we got to this point in climate change is going to be profoundly important in obtaining the funds to help repair the damages. You're all familiar with the tobacco precedent. I think that our history of uh, negligence in the face of our knowledge of climate change has real parallels. And that's the reason that uh, I and my colleagues do the work that we do. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Howie Frumkin from University of Washington, and I uh, just want to begin by thanking this great school of public health and the Pulitzer Center for bringing us together. This, this extraordinary, importantly, this extraordinarily important interface of public health communications and the media and cities uh, couldn't be a more timely set of discussions for us to have. Also, on a personal note, I just can't resist saying that. Being here as part of a communications-oriented session in the presence of the two people who taught me everything I know about communications is really a treat. And those two people are Ed Maybach and Joanne Silberner. I'm only married to one of them. Um, <laughs> sorry, Ed, she asked me first. <laughs> but I want to pick up on something that was embedded in Ed's talk. You may have heard this. I'm going to highlight it, and then I'm going to riff on it. And that's something is the, the core essence of social marketing, of how we communicate in public health and in other fields. And what Ed has taught me, that the Maybach Manifesto, if you will, is simple, clear messages repeated often from a variety of trusted sources. Simple, clear messages repeated often from a variety of trusted sources. I'll stop at this point. <laughs> now, one of those trusted sources is health professionals. And that's the reason that we're convened here today. 
So I'd like to take my few minutes to reflect with you on how is it that health professionals do or don't function as messengers regarding climate change? What are the barriers that they face, that we face, and how might we overcome those barriers? I'm going to propose five barriers that health professionals face in fully self-actualizing as messengers about climate change, and then reflect a little bit on how to overcome those barriers. The five barriers uh, correspond to the five vowels, A, E, I, O, and U. It's easy to remember, and I don't even have to use PowerPoint to uh, inflict the messages on you that way. A is advocacy. Now, advocacy is kind of a bugaboo in the health world. And I have to distinguish the various kinds of health professionals because advocacy functions differently for different kinds of health professionals. There are academic researchers and health scientists, like many of the ones who work here at BU and other universities. There are public health officials whose job description includes communicating with the public, like Barbara from LA County. And there are the clinicians who are out there taking care of patients every day. For those groups, advocacy is a different kind of a challenge. For university-based scientists, advocacy is really difficult. There is actually active debate about whether scientists ought to be advocates. Many scientists consider that taking an advocacy position sullies themselves somehow. It's like losing their virginity. You're not really a scientist if you engage in advocacy. Many clinicians are also reluctant to be advocates, but for a different reason, and maybe a very good reason. When you come to see me in clinic, and I'm caring for you, what I want to be all about is compassion, understanding, and non-judgmentalism. And I may not want to flog you with particular uh, messages if they seem to be partisan or the subject of advocacy. Now, all of this is, shouldn't be as troubling as it is. No health professional has difficulty advocating smoking cessation or physical activity. But this is a different domain. This is a highly politicized domain, or as, as Nathaniel Rich put it earlier, I think this is a direct quote. It, it's kind of a, a lovely mixture of New York Times auspicious prose and New Orleans je ne sais quoi. He said, toxic polarization and corporate agitprop. This issue, to our great shame, has become a highly polarized issue. And when historians look back at this era, they will shake their heads that we allowed this issue to become so polarized. It shouldn't be. But it is, and that means that it becomes a barrier for scientists all the way to clinicians to talk about uh, climate change because they may feel that they're doing advocacy of something that's a little distasteful. What do we need to do about that? We need to normalize this subject as a health subject, move it away from being a politically polarized subject, and frame it accordingly, and make it normalized to talk about it. E, E is empowerment. Uh, we know in the health world that if we give people grim news or a bad prognosis without empowering them to do something about it, they turn off. If I tell you, you're going to get cancer, end of story, you're not going to come back to see me in clinic and you're not even going to listen to what I've said. But if I say, you're at risk of cancer, and it's a serious risk, but here are the three things you can do to reduce your risk. Now we have a basis to work. So several speakers today have talked about the fact that that grim messages, unmitigated by action steps that the recipients can take, don't work very well. So of course, we need not only to be pointing out the health threats of climate change, but the positive steps people can take to reduce those threats, and as importantly, if not more so, the benefits that flow from taking those steps, benefits that involve a healthier life, happier life, uh, more money in your pocket, and so on. So empowering people to take action and framing this not as a story of deprivation, but as a story of health opportunity is an important way to overcome the empowerment barrier. That's A and E. I is immediacy. Immediacy. This is, of course, an urgent problem. But if I'm seeing you in clinic and you've got a case of pneumonia, or if your asthma is acting up, or if your hypertension is out of control, that's what is on your mind. Climate change is not nearly as immediate. As Ed said, many people think of climate change as a remote problem in time and space, and that certainly is true with regard to clinicians interacting with their patients. I think respecting people's priorities, respecting the salience of the issue, and working messages in, in times and in fashions where people can assimilate them, not when there's something else dominating their attention, is probably the solution to the immediacy problem. O is other people. 
if a health professional gives advice or information about climate change and urges patients or members of the public to do something, who benefits? Well, there's kind of a spectrum in health advice. If I urge you to get more physical activity or to quit smoking or to improve your diet, you will directly benefit. Then there's advice a little farther along the spectrum. If I urge you to have your children vaccinated against an infectious disease, well, your children will benefit. But I'll also remind you that other people's children will benefit too. Those children who can't get vaccinated for medical reasons will also be protected. So there's a sense of collective responsibility and other people's benefits. For some of the things that I might urge you to do to tackle climate change, installing solar, buying an electric vehicle, and so on, you may not feel very much direct and immediate benefit, but there's a collective benefit that if lots of people do what you do, will accrue. Well, the problem with this advice, that if I urge you to do something and you see that other people benefit much more than you do, that's advice that's harder to take. I'm not appealing to your self-interest very much at all. But I think more public health framing in the training and performance of clinicians so that the sense that we're all in it together and the steps that we all ought to be responsible to take are for all of our good is probably a solution to that other people problem. That's A-E-I-O. And finally, U is uncertainty, the uncertainty bugaboo. It is amazing how uncomfortable health professionals, especially academics, are with talking about uncertainty. They hem and they haw. As Gina McCarthy told us, they lead with uncertainty. It doesn't have to be that way. We are accustomed to dealing with uncertainty. If you come into my emergency room with a high fever and a stiff neck and photophobia, I'm going to diagnose you with meningitis and treat you before I've confirmed the diagnosis. Why? Because the downside of not acting could be fatal. Uh, the image that we saw earlier that, that Stacy showed us of the slide indicating that the bridge is out. 97% of scientists think, uh, or engineers think the bridge will go down. Do you want to move ahead? We make decisions all the time in the face of uncertainty. Yes, there is uncertainty about many of the details of climate science and how they'll play out. Uh, there is no uncertainty about the core of the message. And it shouldn't be very difficult for us to draw conclusions and convey messages even in the face of uncertainty. We need to be honest about the uncertainty, but it's not the top headline for this story. So I think the solution to the uncertainty challenge of communicating is to remember that uncertainty is a norm and uncertainty need not and often is not and cannot be a block to action. So I think with AEIOU, if we can move those ahead, um, move beyond them as barriers to health professional communication, we can then do better at entraining this category of trusted messengers so that they can all obey the Maybach Manifesto of delivering simple, clear messages repeated often to those who need to hear. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sabrina McCormick. I um, am, as mentioned, am a sociologist and I'm also a filmmaker. So it's such a pleasure to be in this group and this stellar panel and stellar meeting today um, because I have a foot both in the world of communicating, actually doing the communications as well as generating the evidence that is sometimes being communicated. And so it's, it's just great to to see these world um, brought together, it's such a rare occurrence for me. Um, so I'm gonna make two points today, um, one from my research work and one from my film work, although the first one is kind of comes out of my research work. So um, in 2012, I began to be uh, a producer on the Years of Living Dangerously. This was a series that about climate change. Some people are nodding their head, but not everybody. Um, about climate change that premiered the season one in 2013, I think. Um, we won the Emmy in 2014, which was very exciting. Um, for that, I uh, produced a, a story with Matt Damon about the health effects of heat waves. And this was, it was a hard thing to do. It, was, it took a lot of work. I mean, I thought writing a dissertation was really hard. I was wrong. Producing a, a TV show is a, a much, much harder. And it was super exciting because I felt like, wow, you know, it's Matt Damon. We can make a real impact, reach a lot of people. And in fact, you know, maybe we did. It's a little unclear. Um, and, you know, I, I felt like it was just such a great opportunity. 
And then, you know, we screened the episode on Capitol Hill, and of course only the Democrats came, and that was a little disappointing. Um, and then, you know, the, the story lived on into the, into the social media landscape, the story and the, the season. And then the executive producers moved forward with producing season two. So my colleagues at GW and I decided that it would be very interesting in part as motivated by, you know, how much I had invested in, in my work in season one to know what was this series actually doing to anyone? Was it motivating behavior change, opinion change, attitude change, anything? Did it make any difference? And so we started to do this research work. Um, that brings me to the first point that I want to make, is, which is as we are thinking about communicating to audiences with any message around climate change, be it health or otherwise, we need to know who our audience is. So, what are they thinking about? How do they think about climate change? And what are the obstacles to them taking action? What do they care about? And so I'm going to just quote, give you three quotes from the social media part of our research about the responses to um, some of this season two, just to give you a sense of what we learned. So one person said, and I, I, we looked at Facebook and Twitter, and I'm not sure if this is Facebook or Twitter, it's one or the other, I think it's Facebook. God tells us that the hemispheres will exchange weather patterns and warns throughout the Bible about these natural disasters. Also along this theme of God and uh, divinity and the role of climate change, if they would just read the word of God, they would see it's all been already laid out. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Can't stop it from happening, sorry. So while there were many, many positive comments on social media platforms about these series, this is some of the pushback. These are some of the skeptical kinds of responses. On another front, when referring to the need to tax carbon or to create some economic incentives to drive a renewable energy economy, one person says, do you idiots really want $20 per gallon gas Food so expensive that only the wealthy can afford to eat and more intrusive government controlling every aspect of your lives while the economy ceases to exist, resulting in astronomical unemployment. You all think your ideas are so brilliant, but it's obvious that you don't think them through. What I see here is a bunch of future elitist politicians. So if we are interested in reaching out to populations who are not those already concerned about climate change and some question has been raised already today about are those audiences who we care about, and I would argue that they are, then we have to know where they stand and what is the language, the framework of values that they possess, that they bring to the table as we are communicating to them. So that's my first point. Um, my second point is that we have an opportunity, really I think a very um, unprecedented opportunity to use creative approaches to storytelling that new innovations in technology um, amongst, you know, just creative innovations that have been happening recently allow us to um, take advantage of now. And I'm going to use the example of a, a, a project that I am just finishing um, to, to offer the example of fiction storytelling based on real, real life events. As one type of storytelling we might engage in to reach broader audiences. I, I have a, a colleague who um, measures viewership of uh, content um, around the world, both legal and illegal downloads. So this is the real number. And he says that the fiction content is something, it's consumed something like a hundredfold more than documentary content. So if we really want to be reaching as many people as possible and as wide a variety of people as possible, fiction may be the way to go. So I've been working on a story based in the Brazilian Amazon which doesn't have much obviously to do with human health and climate change and actually doesn't have much obviously to do with climate change and we've struggled with that a lot as we've edited. Um, but I'm going to show you the, the trailer in just a moment but just to preface that, um, it's set in the Brazilian Amazon where deforestation rates in the past couple of years have been skyrocketing, in part driven by a, a recent increase in, the, in built infrastructure, so dams, roads, airports, bridges, which are funded by billions and billions of dollars from the private sector. 
And one thing that we see in the literature is that one way to protect, in fact, the most effective way to protect rainforest from encroaching deforestation is to protect, legally protect indigenous lands. So why do I care about deforestation other than forests are pretty? We cannot avert catastrophic climate change without reducing deforestation levels and protecting rainforests around the world. So I've made this film. I'm going to show you this trailer, I think. Yeah, do we have a video ready? It should be. OK, great. Um, just hold it one second. Um, so I will say this is a work in progress. The film is not done yet. So I'd love feedback afterwards. We are still editing this trailer. But um, let's, let's go ahead and watch it now. Thank you. Antes do meu pai, havia apenas 56 arara. Eu sou o número 85. Nosso objetivo é fazer a mudança de todas as famílias aqui, dessa região, para lá. Não, não posso convencer. Shit. The licensors for the dam. Four of them have been killed. Is this going to be an impediment? What are four deaths when there's four billion on the line? Who's this guy? He's writing the final report. Cadê Camojan? Não sei. A moça se encontra aqui. É, pode vir pegar. Cuidar de você. Trabalhar para mim. Não, menina, uma criança. Eu vou deixar ela aqui. Você tá procurando uma menina? Procure o Jonas. Você tá me machucando, não sei. Onde tá minha filha? Boa noite. Boa noite. Tom Vogel. Your company is the biggest foreign investor in Belomonte. We want what you want, which is to get this report down the right way. Carol tá na minha aldeia. Eu vou levar você pra sua aldeia. Não, 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 não! Help! Eu ouvi o meu pai. E o fato de existirmos é um milagre. Os ventos índios permanecem aqui e a paralisação das obras da usina de Belo Monte. Why would I do something like this? Cadê ela? Eles criam um aparelho monstruoso só para matar o meu rio. So that that every story element in the film is as you see in the trailer, they're inspired by or based on real life events, which are we've melded in together into this, this fictional um, narrative. So that's just one example. But there are so many creative ways of engaging audiences. There's virtual reality, which is incre increasingly used, expanding in use, generates empathy, can catalyze even um, changes in the way that people think about their own identity, their own place in the world. So. Um, I, that's just a piece I want to kind of throw into this discussion that we're having about communicating about climate change, the role of health, and, and what we might be able to do to empower people to uh, affect change, as has been raised many times today. So I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, if the panelists could come up to the front and maybe take the seats toward the other end. so you kind of halfway looking at me. We'll uh, go to a uh, general discussion. And I hope that there are questions, that people are preparing their questions. And uh, I'll begin with uh, just a couple myself. We got Jack making your way here. It's interesting that um, at a time when the, the, the political right uh, has made a, a big thing out of the, the dis dismissing climate change reporting as fake news that we have Sabrina making the case that maybe we need to go overtly to fiction to help tell these stories. And that might be one way of addressing uh, that issue. I'm, I'm curious as to what all of you think uh, that uh, the three uh, other panelists responding to, uh, to Ed's point that, that journalists for the most part, in his view, I think if I understand this correctly, are, are not, are not telling these stories, or at least not telling them in an effective way. And, and I'm interested in, in the perspective of, of Jack as a journalist and, and Sabrina and, and Howie coming up from, from the more academic side. Is to, to, do you see that as well? And, and if so, why? 
Uh, well, I, for my part, just would say that there's a tremendous volume of journalism being uh, performed in the climate space, and a great deal of it is quite evocative and narrative in form and um, uh, 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 meets uh, uh, the highest standards of this kind of journalism. It is very time consuming. It is. Um, uh, it, it requires a great deal of skill. Not all of us have those skills. And it's very demanding. And not every piece of journalism can be a long form narrative um, uh, tearjerker. Um, there are news developments that need to be reported. And um, there's substantive material that underlies the science that needs to be explained. Some of our most popular pieces at Inside Climate News, um, judging by the readership, which we track very closely, um, are explanatory and really nuts and bolts, primers on complex issues. When we were experiencing the extreme cold early this January and we had a, a piece that explained the relationship to between global warming and the phenomena that we sometimes call the polar vortex. This was a, a primer. This is not a story that is going to be told through the sights and sounds of somebody whose ecosystem is endangered and their family is struggling and so on. This is about the temperature variability between the latitudes and how the Arctic warms more than the mid-latitudes, and therefore the machinery that drives the jet stream causes it to go wobbly, and so that it's heat wave in Anchorage and a cold snap in Boston. And I challenge you to tell that in a narrative, uh, storytelling way. And yet, when we explain that to people, our readers come back to it and back to it and back to it. And week after week, it's the most popular piece on our website. So. Not, it, the, there aren't hard and fast rules for the kinds of journalism that people need to be doing in order to educate the public about climate change. I mean, I can't, the, the work that I do, I can't really answer that question exactly in terms of uh, the ubiquitousness of journalism. But what I can speak to is um, something I've been struggling with a little bit in some of our recent findings around how people react to climate information. and. You know, one of the things in particular that I, I've been thinking a lot about and I don't have a good answer for yet is one thing that we see is that even when people consume information that they're interested in and they're convinced by, they're, they find, fa I mean, factual, like uh, they care about all of these things, they still don't know what to do. So they walk away from what they see and they don't do anything. And this is true in our research, even for Democrats who are very liberal, who already knew about climate. You know, all of the, that you would think these, this particular population is highly motivated, but they don't, they, there's like a, there's a disconnect between the knowledge about climate change and the action. And this to me is something that I, I think I'm struggling with, and I hope that we can figure out a better way of addressing. So John, I, uh, two comments and a question. Um, I, I should say that I, I believe Ed's statements that journalists are ready and willing to tell these stories, mostly because Ed said so. Um, <laughs> but there are two points that came from this morning's conversation that I think are, are very relevant. Uh, one is that journalistic willingness is different than editorial willingness. And so there's a barrier between a journalist being willing to tell the story and the story getting into print or onto the air, and that is the editors wanting to run it. We learned that from Joanne. So uh, there is a second level of, of persuasion that has to take place. The second comment is the importance of solution journalism. It was raised in this morning's session. So it, it isn't just that there's either climate journalism or not climate journalism, it's how it's done and the extent to which it focuses on solutions and empowers people to take action matters a lot. Then I'd raise the question, we, we've talked a lot today about journalism, and your question just now was about journalism, but journalism is to the transfer of information as schools are to education. That is, journalism is one institutional form of a more pervasive and, and broad-based process. 
I've been very mindful today that as we've spoken about journalism through the course of the day, uh, that thing over there is going on. I, I think that's a Twitter feed, right? Um, I don't do Twitter. I, I'm proud to say I have a Facebook free and Twitter free life. But I, I am aware that many, many people consume their information not from journalism, but from social media and from the mutterings of their friends and loved ones. And so understanding the anatomy of how belief systems are formed and reinforced matters a lot. So your question was, you know, what do we think about whether journalists are ready to do more reporting? It's a very good question, but it's only part of a broader landscape of how opinions are formed and behaviors are changed. So yeah, I'm a, I think I'm also just maybe professionally, institutionally wary of the notion that there's one way to do these things. And this, this, a lot of the discussion uh, throughout the day has been about if only we made the, the positive case, if, we, if people understood that that they could live healthier um, lives, have better lifestyles, live in cleaner, more pleasant uh, urban environments, uh, that the climate change would be, that would be sort of an ancillary event, a benefit of doing that, and we would save the, save the planet in the long term as well. Whereas I think some of what, Jack, you were talking about, sort of in, in the notion was that, that we shouldn't, uh, we, should, we should maybe move away from the, the more traditional journalistic presentation of this is, you know, be afraid something's going to happen. If you're in the Philippines, I mean, you were you know, very effective talking about what the Philippines is facing now, what they might face in the future, what we might face. And, and I think there's certainly, there, I mean, I definitely am on the side that would say there is a place for that kind of reporting as well. And we need to, to you know, sort through you know, how, to, how to take advantage of both, both the, what you, know, you refer to as the spinach we like to know 80% of what the Pulitzer Center does is spinach journalism, we think, that is sort of trying to, to shed light on things that are not being reported because it's not particularly click-worthy. But, but those, are third, those are challenges. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that there's some danger in journalism of outsmarting ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, if it were not for Twitter and social media, Google and Facebook, these are the drivers of readers to a web-based publication like Inside Climate News. People don't wake up in the morning and have Inside Climate News as their home page on, on their computer. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in every crowd. <laughs> that, those in our newsletter, email newsletters drive the traffic to the, to the site. Um, now, sometimes a hashtag is a miraculous thing, Exxon New lives as a hashtag, but that's only because of the eight months of work of, of, uh, of grinding journalism, shoe leather work, to find the people from 30 or 40 years ago and to find the papers that were um, being written at that time and to understand it in a historical context and to publish 30 or 40,000 words of detail, and that made the hashtag work. And that made Inside Climate News succeed. And those stories were told and structured in a narrative way with a person, but it was a historical figure who made a presentation on a, on a before these things, on a, um, a whiteboard um, with a magic marker. And we knew what he said because he left a memo. And so we were able to write about the Exxon intern who came into his boss and said, gee, look, in 2005, you know, you're going to hit one degree Celsius. And he was pretty damn close based on the knowledge at the time. And that's an interesting story, the kids with the science fair project whose dad was an Exxon engineer. That's a nice little yarn, but it's really just a bait on the hook to get you to read the substance of the, of the report. And there's, in this field, like in public health, there's an awful lot of substance that needs to be conveyed. And you cannot condense it to a bumper sticker. Although you did perfectly con commit it to a bumper sticker. Exxon knew. Right. Two I words. In, <laughs> that's the message. Yeah. An incredibly powerful message mm -hmm. that people can share with one another. Yeah, actually somebody else came up with it, not us. Oh, well, regardless, <laughs> that it, it got distilled into a message that yes, is deeply right. meaningful to, to yeah, a large right. and growing number of people. Yeah, that's true. So you, you, Ed, you would see the value of that kind of 
shoe leather, deep reporting, sort of factual, you know, unearthing these documents and all of that. And then, oh yeah, and absolutely. And then it's more a question. Then it's more a question of how it's how it's made use of, how it's how you know how you and others who are trying to communicate. Well, so we have to keep in mind that the, the society is a complex place. There's lots of kinds of actors, lots of motivations to want to know. Most people don't want to know. Most Americans, and this is, this is every six months we do a national, we, Tony Leiseritz and I do a nationally representative poll and we find the same thing time in and time out. Most Americans tell us they don't talk about climate change, they don't hear hear other people in their lives talking about climate change, they don't actually even read or hear about climate change in the news more frequently than once a month. That's sort of like the mode, the, the average. Um, most people don't want to know. Readers of Inside Climate News, I'm, I'm not joking, I, you know, this is like my go-to news source, the most <laughs> important thing I read, um, and others, but, but Inside Climate News is just absolutely extraordinary. I have, an, I have an, extraordinarily, uh, well, an extraordinary set of reasons, of motivations for wanting to know the, the deep stuff, as do lots of other people. That's not what, and, and you're, you, Jack, you would, I'm sure, say, the average American isn't your reader. And you don't even aspire, probably, to have them be your right. reader. And I, uh, I also have to say that you have, unlike me, actually studied the subject of how communications works and how it doesn't work. I'm completely flying by the seat of my pants and, uh, you know, classic journalism fashion. Um, so <laughs> I've read your research, I've read other research, and I've got to tell you, this field of research is extremely complicated. It turns out, we've heard a lot about the question of whether a gloom and doom message or an inspirational message is more effective at um, shaking somebody's preconceptions about climate change. And it, I believe, turns out in the peer-reviewed literature, the experimental literature, that that depends on where their preconception had its origin. And some people come to their preconception in one way, and some people come to their preconception in another way. Special interest corporate or some, I don't know what, what and you can flip the effect of, this, of your message. You can have the opposite effect than the one that you intend if you take the wrong approach with the wrong audience. And I haven't got time to think that through. I've been on deadline for 40 years, and, <laughs> and I don't have time to massage my message that way. So I just try to get facts out. And I, I am... I was enthralled to hear Gina McCarthy speak and to hear that, and I, I've known of her work for a long time, uh, when she was up here, when she was in Connecticut, when she was in Washington, and I know how heartfelt those feelings are. I've also read the Clean Power Plan, and it doesn't read like she talks. <laughs> uh, you've got to read the Clean Power Plan to understand the facts of the electric system and, and, the, and to be able to write about this subject, you just have to invest, and I've got, all my, I've got my hands full investing in being inside the docket room of federal agencies as opposed to trying to figure out the most effective way to get my message across. If a story sinks, it sinks. As, you know. I'm going to turn to questions in just a moment, but I, just one other thing I wanted to throw out, and I mean, I, I'm definitely a seat of the pants, deadline oriented sort of guy myself, uh, but I have been struck in the work that we've done at the Pulitzer Center with this question of, of audience and particularly reaching beyond the choir that we're in. And we're probably most of us in, in a, somewhat of the same choir sitting in this room. And it goes to Sabrina's point about you know, doing the years of living dangerously and having Matt Damon and, and you sort of, you know, you dream of something like you have a big celebrity, but then you go up and you do the screening on Capitol Hill and there's nobody there but, but Democrats. And, and is it reaching the people who are not already persuaded? And it's been interesting in our experience. We, we, we bet pretty heavily in the importance of, of after marketing, after repurposing the journalism that, that we fund and taking it out to schools and universities, secondary schools, middle schools, sometimes even elementary schools. And we do something like 600 events a year around the country with our, with our journalists for trying to engage people, partly because we think if we get out into a university setting, even more so if we get into uh, schools, secondary schools and, and middle schools, you're, you're finding people who haven't already 
segregated, self-selected their choirs. And, and there's a possibility of actual engagement and, and persuasion. And in, in trying to, part of, you know, I spend half my time trying to raise money to support the work that we do, and it's, it's much easier, and I don't quite understand why, it's much easier to raise money for the, for the kind of journalism, doing the journalism, that part of our mission, than the educational outreach part. And I, I think there's a, and I think that's a, to me, and I'm interested in what you all think, because I think it's a, it's a failure of imagination on the part of a, a lot of news media outlets is they don't understand that the, the days of, of just being able to put out a great story and, and assume that it's going to be read and it'll have an impact, that's over. I mean, we're, we're, we're so fragmented in the, in the media world that we have today that you have to go out proactively and really work hard to find the people you want to reach, and particularly the people who are not already in agreement with you. And, and, and I, I'm eager to hear what any, any of you think about that challenge. Well, I, I would just say briefly that inside Climate News, as we grow, we're expanding our mission in interesting ways, I believe. This summer, for the first time, we're having a high school journalism camp in New York City, where we're bringing students in for three weeks of journalism training uh, on environmental journalism. And that is, uh, is part of our mission of influencing the world of journalism as we have done as a, a leading nonprofit um, specialty publication without subscriptions and uh, without any uh, uh, supervising institution of any kind. Um, the second thing is we are establishing a, a network of partnership relationships around the country in places that we perceive to be underserved by climate journalism. And um, we have received the grant making to um, allow us to set up the first hub of this network in Louisville to work in the southeast and to seek out partners in those areas. And we've uh, hired a, um, uh, a very talented uh, journalist, Jim Bruggers, from the um, Louisville Courier Journal, a very experienced and well-known voice of environmental journalism in that region, to run those partnership ventures. And so we're constantly trying to come up with uh, new ways to expand our audience because uh, if we don't, we're just such a tiny blip in the journalism scene that our work would just go down the drain. We can't, of course, allow that to happen. John, I'd just comment that what you said was uncannily relevant to the health science side, too. So you said something like, we're past the time when a journalist can just put a story out there and hope mm -hmm. that it has legs. When a researcher does a piece of research and generates data, Typically, the researcher just puts it out there, a different venue, a scientific uh, peer-reviewed journal rather than a newspaper, and hopes that it has legs. So I think that if there's a shared uh, strategy here, it's being much more intentional about framing and delivering stories and targeting them so that they actually get to where we want them to be and people hear them. I just want to, I want to add a specific experience that relates so directly to this line of thinking. So last fall, I published what I thought was a very small paper on the risks of heat and climate change to pregnant women and fetuses. It was a review paper. There was no empirical evidence. Thought, whatever. And <laughs> it got, <laughs> yeah, I know, this does not help my tenure case very much, but you know, <laughs> I was interested in it as a question, as a research question, and I did not take the approach you recommend, which I agree with. I just published this thing. And um, it got a lot of media pickup, especially in India. I don't know why. And then it got a lot of pickup in the conservative press. And they reframed it as um, pregnancy. Uh, we shouldn't be concerned about the risk of fetuses to climate change, but to abortion. So they, they just did this. It was fascinating. I did not expect it. But it, to me, it raises the point of, OK, well, you put a piece of research out there. People will do whatever they want with it. But then you know, it, 
the framing of the findings can have as much impact as the findings themselves. So that, I think, is, as a researcher, I don't know what I can possibly do about that because we are confined by the peer, and, and I think appropriately so, the peer review process through which you only speak to what you can actually factually say. So it's, there's a bit of a, a, tough, a tough thing there. Sometimes there is a story with, that you're very fortunate to come up with a story that both drives the appropriate message and is also just fabulous clickbait. And you, you, <laughs> and, you know, you, take, you seize those opportunities just to help introduce people to your news product because they're never going to see all the Paris uh, IPCC headlines in the world. They're not going to drag them in, but, a, but a, a nice piece of clickbait will do it and then maybe they'll come back. Um, my son's a moral psychologist, uh, and he's uh, here at Harvard, and, and um, I think the most famous piece of research he ever did was he and his lab students went down to Fenway Park and asked people leaving the game, is it okay if the other guy beans your um, batter for your guy to bean their pitcher? Um, and you know, is that morally all right? even though we know it's against the rules. And I've forgotten what the results were, but you know, you guys know Fenway Park. <laughs> I think it depends on whose guy throws the first bean ball. Whether the Red Sox were hit first or second. But, but he was astounded at the amount of play that that got and how it drove traffic to his moral psychology lab and web website. And some of those people actually, I, I assume, stayed to get the the rest of the message. So I'm looking at the clock and guessing I might get to say one last thing. Okay. So I'm going to just go ahead and take the prerogative and say one last thing. Joel, we have a little bit of extra time. Oh, we'll good. Go, well, we'll go, maybe, you go ahead no and we'll go to questions. To me, so no, I'm you just going to no, no, launch go it we'll anyway. Go. Um, I am a public health professional, first, foremost, and always. So for those of you in the, uh, in the audience who are also fellow public health or health professionals, uh, it is my sense that this is our moment um, in terms of health, in terms of a an opportunity to help reframe the issue of climate change and reframe the issue of fossil fuel use in a fundamentally helpful way. Helpful way, excuse me. Um, two years ago, my colleagues at George Mason and I um, decided to take a little chance to do something that's not terribly academic, but it, it seemed important to do anyway, and that is we invited the representatives of eight medical societies to come to Washington to a meeting to talk with us and, and to talk to one another about the prospect of linking arms as sort of an organized voice of American medicine, link arms and share with the public what you know, what they know about climate and health. Um, we did this because we had surveyed the membership of three of those medical societies in advance and, and quite to my delight and, and ast astonishment, um, American physicians, at least uh, m the f members of the National Medical Association, that's African American doctors, the American Thoracic Society, and the Quad AI, asthma, allergy, and immunology, they were, they're completely on board understanding that climate change is bad for health, that they, most of them see climate change already harming the health of their patients, and they were, in, in response to our survey, they gave very clear uh, mandate to their leaders of their professional society, the mandate was lean in, like get to it, roll up your sleeves and start advocating on behalf of our patients' health. And so this first meeting two years ago, I was astound astounded that in we pitched a, pitched a consortium linking arms to work together to them that morning, and they walked out that afternoon, all eight said, we're going to run this by our board. We think this is a really good idea. We just had our first public meeting two weeks ago in, in Washington. The group is called the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Our most important message is incredibly simple. Climate change is harming our health. There's a second important message, and the opportunity to get to 100% clean energy is one of the most important things we can do for our health, both in the long term and today. Um, and we now have 22 medical societies who are part of this consortium, they represent almost 60% of all American physicians. This thing came together almost painlessly. 
and incredibly rapidly. And, and we're, we're still trying to explore how best to take advantage of this moment. But this is clearly a moment we are in. So those of you who are interested in, in contributing to that moment, I, I, I encourage you to jump in. The, the water's fine. <laughs> So we, we do have time for a few questions. Are, are there questions? We have microphones, I think, in the middle, one in the back there. Yes, thank you. Um, Brita Lundberg, uh, infectious disease physician and uh, health advocate, actually. So I have a comment and two questions. Um, my comment is just generally that we need to see this more of an issue as in the here and now, uh, one of the very first panelists said, most people think climate change uh, will harm Americans, but won't present any harm to them. It's interesting to me because in the series of, of talks that we've heard today, uh, I was just counting two out of three of the people figuring in the pictures um, had brown skin. So that might not maybe make people think of the United States. They were also from overseas. Um, of pictures of drought that figured in many of these slides, they were from drought in Africa, flooding in Pakistan. The pictures of pollution were from Beijing and Mexico City. When Houston was mentioned, I just wrote the words because they were very interesting to me. It was, quote, even here in the US, Houston occasionally is plagued by smog pollution. I then, just out of curiosity, looked up the data. Actually, that's 107 days out of a year. That's not every now and then. Um, my questions, my questions are, um, first, the emphasis has also been on, we should be positive about this. This should be a really positive thing. We need to give people solutions to take home, and I agree with that. But there are so many things in the media that aren't positive, right? Our fear factor is played on all the time. We need to be worried about terrorism, and yet the president of Woods Hole pointed out that climate change presents a much larger uh, risk to human health than any amount of terrorism that is currently going on in the world. The fear factor of building uh, monumental bo uh, barriers on our borders. Um, there's a huge fear factor at play here, and yet somehow we don't play the fear card. A, a professor, a friend of mine at Stanford, said, you know, the, the research is so concerning on climate change, people would be terrified if they knew. But maybe they should know, maybe we should be, so that's, I guess, one of my questions, why don't we play the fear card more? And then a question to Dr. Frumpkin is, as health professionals, how can we do more? How can we advocate in a direct way to our patients uh, on this issue? Thank you. Well said. Comments? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Great comments. Let me uh, start with the last piece, uh, since that was the piece you directed to me. One of the great opportunities is for us to green the healthcare sector. We, we are in this country about one-sixth of the economy. And among commercial properties, we're second only to the food industry in the energy footprint per square foot of commercial space. So by greening the healthcare sector, we can make a contribution to tackling climate change. We can also save money for the healthcare sector, which desperately needs that. And as importantly, we can set an example for our communities and our patients. Uh, in fact, we should do that personally. As many of us as possible should be biking to work and probably wearing the bicycle helmet into the exam room before you take it off to make it clear that this is a healthy set of behaviors and in the same way that we should not be smoking and we should not be living sedentary lives, we should be doing uh, carbon sensitive things as, as healthcare providers. It's setting an example, being a trusted source uh, is a really opportune thing for us to do. Then you mentioned also um, emphasizing the here and now. I, it, it's, I, I think you're exactly right. I think some of the risks are highest and the impacts will be greatest in the poorest parts of the world, so it's important to tell those stories. It's equally important to make clear that it's not just a remote problem, it's a nearby problem. And balancing the messages, I think it's very circumstance dependent. It depends on the audience and the setting and, and so on. But I, uh, I, I take your point that we need very much to make clear that this is a here and now problem affecting all of us. Uh, and as far as why not playing the fear card more, I want to hear what my colleagues think on that, but it, there's, you actually raise a set of empirical questions. What is the best way to get the message across in ways that improve knowledge and change attitudes and affect behaviors? Is it fear? Is it fear plus empowerment? Is it good news only without much fear? 
Probably the answer is variable depending on the population and the circumstances, but we actually need the research to answer that so that rather than flying by the seat of our pants, we can say, well, this much fear and this much constructive action is the perfect mixture. So I, at risk of falling into the trap that Jack laid earlier about uh, that the communication research is pretty complicated stuff. It, uh, it points to all kinds of perilous um, perilous maneuvers that, that we shouldn't, uh, if we know better, we shouldn't uh, um, partake of. Um, there are a lot of good reasons to care about clean energy. And, and actually, if you, most Americans uh, fundamentally believe that, that our future, a better future, is a clean energy future, and that a fossil fuel economy is a thing of the 20th century, and the faster we can make it a thing of the, you know, make that our default of the 21st century, the better off we'll be for, this is the, the perilous part. Um, if you include climate change as one of the reasons for that, for most Americans, that actually adds additional um, justification um, and, and makes the, the, pro the proposition even more attractive. For very conservative Americans, it makes it slightly less attractive. So if you back off the climate change part, which very conservative Americans tend not to want to hear about or believe in, um, they're still willing in large numbers, and by large numbers I mean 80, 85 percent in, in public opinion polling, they still support all kinds of policy propositions that will accelerate that transition to a, a clean energy future. Um, so there, there are a lot of good reasons to care about the solutions. And, and you, you can offer those reasons up without raising fear. On the other hand, I do believe we have a moral obligation to tell people what our risks are. Um, and as a public health professional, I absolutely believe we have a moral obligation to, under, to explain that there are really serious, profound risks to our health, our children's health, our parents' health, et cetera. Um, those two things, risk information and solution information, happily, the research shows they work well together. You get a better output, outcome from your communication when you can give reasons people to care and then give them solutions commensurate with the, the problems that they're trying to solve. You one more question? Here, go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah. no. Question here. I'll keep it brief. I'm Kara Rogers. I'm with Eversource and the Energy Efficiency Group. Um, in addition to Inside Climate News and the uh, communications work that's coming out of George Mason, which I do follow, um, if one is interested in becoming a better communicator, um, a better communicator of solutions, what should we be reading? What should we be watching? Uh, can you recommend a source or a book? My personal favorite, the one that I make all of my students read, Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. I, everything I personally need to know to be a better communicator is laid out in a simple acronym that they have organized their book around. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. A strong recommendation for Made to Stick. Okay. Any last question, burning question? Um, this has been a fabulous panel. And I, and I, I just, um, we're coming to the end of the day, and, and I want to thank you all for, for giving us this day. and, and uh, amazing range of people that we've uh, heard from and, and lots of sources of inspiration and, and you know, what's happening at, in, at the cities and what we heard from Los Angeles and Toronto, Boston, um, the ways that, that people are relating and conveying data to the neighborhood level and, 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 and inspiring people to take actions in their own communities uh, is, is really quite fabulous and, and, and encouraging that, that uh, and again, particularly against the backdrop of what we're seeing at the national political level uh, today. And I think in what we've heard from the journalists as, as well and sort of thinking about how we communicate uh, these issues that, that I mean, it's, I think it's clear from this panel discussion that there's not, there's not, there's not one set way to do this. We, 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 we bring diverse talents and and, and types of storytelling uh, to, to convey this uh, information. But the important thing, as I think your question at the back said, is to, is to make sure that, that, that we uh, let people know that it is here and now, that there is that urgency that gets infused in our reporting and our, in our storytelling, and that, and that we take advantage of, listen to people 
like Ed and Howie and others that have talked about the importance of, of simple communication, translation, uh, repetition, and not being afraid to come back at the, at the issue again and again. Because um, uh, if, if, if the average person is only um, exposed to one story a month, that, that we, we do ourselves and, and, and the country and the world a grave disservice if we think that, well, we did that last year, so we don't need to address it again. We have to keep at it and keep thinking of, of new ways, whether it's Sabrina's uh, story, uh, a fictional story, or the, the really uh, deep dive uh, investigative a documentary, evidentiary reporting that, that Inside Climate News has, has, has done so well at, it all has a place. And, 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 and lastly, I'd just like to say that, that uh, this is, we've never had a, a, a meeting with our partners at, at the Boston School of Public, Boston University School of Public Health, where I didn't learn a lot. And I think just the idea, the fact that we can bring together journalist perspectives and and the, and the health professionals uh, is, is just incredibly valuable. And we're grateful to everyone at the, the School of Public Health, both for today and for all the work that you do and for making these collaborations possible. So I want to turn to Pat Kenny for his final thoughts, and then we'll be on our way. Thanks. Thanks, John. It was, it was really a, a great thing that we were able to team up on this. Uh, I forget when, when we first started talking about the idea of pulling the journalists together with the public health and the city people, and but you know, six or nine months ago, and I think it turned out really well. Um, I'd like to thank the fantastic speakers and panelists from today, um, and also especially to thank the audience for sticking with us. Um, I think it was really stimulating. Um, some novel thoughts and, and concepts that were discussed. Um, I'm really excited. So on behalf of the School of Public Health and in particularly the Environmental Health Department at the School of Public Health, I'd like to thank you all for being here and, and uh, good luck with all of your future works. Thank you.